I stood by the window in the hospital room. If I had good binoculars or a small telescope, I could see the house where our little family was so happy for so many years. I looked out the window, regretting that everything ended so badly. My thoughts were focused on my only husband, Tim Sherman. We chose this house together. We liked him immediately. The view of the valley from the terrace was magnificent. This was a home made for us. I remember Tim looking me in the eyes and saying, Holly, this is where we will raise our family. I agreed with all my heart. Tim was the man of my dreams. He was a handsome, hardworking man with real moral fortitude. He was reliable, honest, and loyal. He had a wonderful soul. He worked on the railroad. I was a high school teacher. In addition to his work on the railroad, he was also a lay preacher in our church. Did he have any flaws? I didn't notice them for a long, long time. He happily shared family and household responsibilities with me as we raised our three children. We have two daughters, Dolly and Anna, and a son, Jeremy. Of course, eventually the kids grew up and left us with the proverbial empty nest. Dolly was the first to leave when she married a wonderful young man named Christo. Then it was Anna's turn when she married Zet. He was not a particularly religious young man, although I really liked him. I was afraid Tim wouldn't approve of him. But Tim didn't judge Zeta in any way. When Zeth proposed in an old-fashioned way and asked for Anna's hand in marriage, Tim quickly gave his consent and blessing. In fact, Tim performed the marriage ceremony that brought Zeta and Anna together in the eyes of God. Finally, we lost Jeremy to a wonderful girl named Eloise. When Jeremy vacated his room, we became empty nesters. Coincidence or not, I started to change. As the days passed, I began to wish my life was more exciting. Tim was a good husband, a good provider, and a great father, but he was, so to speak, a little boring. He never did anything to rock my world. I know that my complaint would be considered petty by most people. I'm sure many women would dream of the life I lived. When we were raising our kids, I didn't care if we never went to exotic or exclusive places or did anything super exciting. Our life together was rather ordinary, but we had many good moments. However, deep down, I now wanted something exotic. I wanted exclusivity. I wanted excitement. We also never did super erotic acts in bed. Our sex life was good, but very predictable. Now I want new adventures, positions, and routines. I wanted super erotic sex. Perhaps it was a midlife crisis. Perhaps it was because of our empty nest. I knew that my life was getting closer to the end. I began to realize that this is not rehearsal. This is the real deal. Maybe this is the only chance. What if that's all we have? I don't want to get to the end without doing some exciting things. I wanted more variety in my life. I wanted more action. I wanted better sex and more of him. What I had was a boring life and a husband who developed erectile dysfunction. Please understand that I was not hurt or taken advantage of. In fact, I never doubted Tim's love at all. He was a wonderful man and was as loyal as an old dog. I just wanted a mischievous new puppy. I'm sorry, but that's how it happened. The biggest complaint I had was that Tim was the Christian head of the family. Our church, and I believe most churches, have taught that the man is the head of the family in all respects. He was the one who was responsible for the family. As such, he had the final say on everything. He made important decisions. To be fair, Tim discussed most things with me. But we were not equal partners in our marriage. I felt that he was the master of everything, including me. I couldn't tell him that I wanted new sexual experiences because he would just remind me of the teachings of the church. God has ordained only one way for spouses to have sex and only one position in which to do so. Strangely, this was called a missionary position. It would also remind me that God created only one cavity in a woman for sex. This cavity served for the conception of the child, and then for his birth nine months later. He'd say it's a pleasure, in another way is an abomination in the eyes of God. Don't get me wrong, our sex has been enjoyable and loving for many years. Predictable, but satisfying. When E.D. appeared, it was no longer as satisfying. Because of his reluctance to discuss personal and inappropriate things with another person, even with a doctor, he did not seek medical help for his ED problem. All this led to a perfect storm, which soon led to thunder and lightning. 
My children were gone and my painful monthly menstrual cycle stopped too. Maybe it was a coincidence, but I began to act on my desire to get more out of life. This became a reality when I decided that I needed a motorcycle. What do you want? Tim exclaimed. Do you know how dangerous these cars are, my dear? In a collision with a car, the motorcycle always loses. You are a mother. If you do not give up this idea for your own safety, think about your children. Come on, Tim. Our kids are grown and living their own lives. It's not like they need me now like they used to. I want to do something for myself, for a change. I want to live on the edge at least once a day. Life. I need to try performing without a network. Where are you going to keep the motorcycle? There's definitely no room for it in the garage. I've already thought of everything, Tim. The Browns have agreed to let me keep him in their barn. It's only a stone's throw from our house. So you're going to take money from our joint account to buy yourself a motorbike? Don't I have a word? Can I tell you where our money goes, honey? I'm glad you mentioned it, Tim. I opened my own bank account, and I think you should do the same. From now on, I will put half of my earnings into my personal account and half into our joint account. You should do this, too. Then each of us will have some money that we can spend on ourselves without the approval of the other. It looks like you're slowly but surely moving on from our marriage, Holly. Is that what it's all about? It depends on whether you let me do some things on my own or not. For example, I won't give up my Harley. Have you already bought it? Is that what I hear, Holly? You heard right, Tim. I have my own hog. Do you want to see him? I'll miss it, Holly. I think we should make an appointment with Elder Simpson to discuss our family problems. We've been together too long to just throw everything away. That's where we're going with your attitude, Holly. Tim, I'm not going to talk to Elder Simpson. I don't need to listen to him quote scripture to me about the man being the boss. This may have been true when this mythical book was written, but nowadays marriage should be a joint effort. Both partners should have an equal say in everything. What happened to you, Holly? How can you call the Bible a mythical book? You, of all people, should know that there is no such thing as equality in everything. Things just don't work that way. Someone has to be the final authority. Everyone must contribute, but ultimately, someone must be responsible for creating a solution in cases where the parties cannot agree. Why does this man always have to be a man, Tim? You know what the Bible says, Holly. You know these words, but let me refresh your memory. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Just as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. It's from Ephesians 5, 22, 33, Holly. Yes, Tim, I know these words. I don't think they apply to the modern world. After this conversation, Tim moved all his clothes into the spare bedroom. Everything that was left of our marriage was in grave danger. I joined a motorcycle club and began attending meetings and training sessions. I took horse riding lessons, safety classes, and even a few motorcycle repair classes. There, I met Stefan Barber. He was at least 10 years younger than me. I was attracted to him, and I could tell he was interested in me too. I don't want to brag, but I look much younger than my age. When I hang out with my daughters, we are often considered sisters. I don't look old enough to be their mom. Stefan was very surprised when I told him my age, but that didn't stop him from giving me the full press release. We went to many motorcycle events and picnics together. On buddy trips, we were always buddies. At that point, we only talked at motorcycle events. We were both married. My children are already grown up, but Stefan had three teenage children. He had two daughters and a son. Of course, we were attracted to each other and had a good time together, but that was where it ended. Stefan worked as a car salesman. I decided to trade in my old minivan for something more exciting. I talked to Stefan about this. He said he had just the right car for me. I walked into the showroom, and he showed me a bright red Mustang. I needed this. We agreed on a deal. Stefan gave me a very good deal. After the sale was completed, Stefan suggested they celebrate with lunch together. It was the beginning of a relationship that included more than just motorcycle-related activities. Over time, lunches turned into dinners. Dinner soon became something that could only be called date nights. We had to be very careful. We had to dodge. 
It was difficult, but the relationship developed, slowly but surely. We both thought our marriages were sinking. I was especially afraid of being responsible for the destruction of his family. I didn't want to be responsibly for hurting his young children. He assured me that his marriage was already over. No matter what happens between us, he will get divorced. Meanwhile, my marriage became more and more fractured. When I brought the Mustang home, the real shit fan started working. What the hell are you trying to do, Holly? Can't you act like an adult? First a Harley and now a Mustang? You think these things are going to make you a young girl again? Who are you anyway? For God's sake, grow up and act like an adult. At that time, Tim told me that we would go to Elder Simpson the following week. It wasn't a choice. It was a team. Remember, wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Listen, Tim, I don't believe in this nonsense anymore. You can talk to the exalted elder all you want, but I won't go. Our children are all gone. They were the only connection that kept us together for the last year or so. If you, if you try to force me to talk to Elder Simpson, I'll end it right now. I'm serious, Tim. Our marriage is in your hands. The next day when I returned home from work, Elder Simpson was sitting in our living room with Tim. I just turned around and walked out the door. I went to my sister's house and spent the night on her couch. The next day, I decided to fly away. After time left for work, my sister and I drove her pickup truck to our house. It took a few trips, but I soon became a semi-permanent resident of her guest bedroom, and many of my belongings were put into storage. Most of the reminders of me were removed from the home I had loved so dearly over the years. Without warning, I took the first step out of our marriage. This was soon followed by additional steps. I contacted a law firm specializing in marriage and divorce issues. They assigned me a lawyer. His name was Alvin Lane. He had a degree in psychology in addition to his legal qualifications. I explained my situation to him and told him that I wanted to file for divorce. He searched my heart and mind, looking for ways to save my marriage, but ultimately gave up and instructed his legal team to prepare the necessary documents. Tim called me almost every day. We talked, but neither of us backed down from our positions. After we received the divorce papers, we agreed to meet at a nearby restaurant. He was still looking for ways to save our marriage. I told him I didn't see a future for us. Since he didn't consider our marriage a partnership, there was no point in us continuing. He covered his face with his hands and said, You accused me of extreme mental cruelty. Seriously? I thought that meant I told you that you were a terrible wife or that you weren't a good mother. Something like you were a bad person. And I regret marrying you. Or maybe throwing curse words at you. Have I ever done any of those things? Can you give me an example of my mental cruelty? I replied, What about wives should submit to their husbands in everything? Isn't that a mentally cruel statement, Tim? These are not my words, Holly. If you believe in the Bible at all, you know these are the words of God. Are you divorcing me or are you divorcing God? By the way, Holly, I have also been accused of being an overly controlling spouse. Please tell me what I did that led you to such an accusation. Well, for starters, you never let me drive the car when we went somewhere as a family. Did I ever let you drive? More often than not, when we went on these trips, you had already packed lunch, snacks, and even suitcases. You had already done the things that made the trip possible. Are you saying that I should have made you drive too? Holly, I always thought you'd already done your part. I thought it was my duty to drive. I never suspected you wanted to drive or that you were annoyed that I wouldn't let you drive. Did you ever ask me to let you drive? I'm sure I would let you drive if I knew you wanted or maybe even needed it. I honestly don't remember you ever asking to drive. Can you give me more examples of where I've gone wrong? Please, I need to know, Holly. Oh, Tim, these accusations are just legal jargon. They give some reason for us to break up. It's like cheating or abandonment or irreconcilable differences. It's just a reason that lawyers use. I understand that, Holly. But the reasons you gave are not true and are very unfair and offensive to me. If you so want to get rid of me, then I don't want to deprive you of your freedom. Having said this, he took a pen and signed the divorce petition. He then handed me the papers and left the restaurant. The next time I saw him, was the day we went to court. The judge ordered alimony and half of all our assets. 
including our house. Even though I thought it was excessive, I knew Stefan and I would need the money. Stefan's divorce resulted in him having to pay alimony and child support, in addition to giving the house to his wife, at least until the children reached the age of 18. Stefan had to pay half the rent on the house but had no right to live there. Just think, if his wife marries again, much of this commitment will disappear. For this reason, I can guarantee that she will never marry again. She may be someone's wife in every sense, but she will never make it official. She's smarter than that, and me too. As I was leaving the building, Elder Simpson intercepted me. I saw him in the courtroom, but I certainly didn't want to talk to him. He simply put his hand on my shoulder and said, When you offend one of God's servants, it never goes unpunished. You may avoid punishment for a long time, but it will come. It will come. Crazy old man. If he's trying to scare me, he failed. I felt sorry for Tim, but not because of what Elder Simpson said. Stefan and I didn't move in together after our divorces. I bought a small house with the money Tim gave me when he bought out my share of our house. It was as if Stefan and I were still dating. We were more than friends with benefits, but less than husband and wife. Getting married would be stupid for us because it would stop my alimony payments. Much of our exciting life was financed by my alimony payments from Tim. How incredible is this? Stefan and I have done a lot of exciting things. We attended many major sports league games together, including a World Series game, the Super Bowl, and the Final Four of basketball. There is no doubt that we moved in exclusive circles and lived the very definition of an exciting life. We went on fantastic holidays. We even went to England and France. We have photos of us visiting Big Ben and the Eiffel Tower. We also visited the best national parks, sometimes on our motorcycles. There was excitement both inside and outside the bed. Tim would consider many of the things we did in bed to be sinful. Stefan took me to heights where the air was so thin that I often almost lost consciousness. He introduced me to many things, the most amazing of which was probably my acquaintance with multiple pleasures. Unlike Tim, Stefan did not recognize sexual boundaries. Although Tim was always gentle, Stefan was aggressive. His actions bordered on rudeness. He dominated me and I loved it. In some ways, I fulfilled my biblical role with Stefan more than with Tim. I completely submitted to my man as instructed in the good book. However, I am confident that Elder Simpson would not have seen it that way. He would have given me over to the devil and sent me straight to hell. At first, all my children turned their backs on me. That was the only real price I paid for what I did. Over time, my two daughters accepted the reality of my new life. Only Anna forgave me. Dolly didn't forgive me, but she accepted me and allowed me back into her life. My son may never accept what I did, not to mention forgiveness. He's completely on his dad's side and refuses to talk to me unless it's absolutely necessary. The first dark cloud of my new life appeared when a hailstorm passed through the city. It damaged the roofs of almost all houses in the city. Mine was no exception. I needed a new roof, but I had insurance, so it wasn't that bad. When the crew arrived to do the roofing work, they discovered that part of the roof's supporting structure had rotted away. Upon further investigation, they discovered that one entire wall was rotted and covered in toxic mold. The cost of renovating the house was 20000 I bought a house for 80000 thousand. If I had renovated it, I would have invested $100,000 into a house that cost $80,000. I consulted with an attorney about the possibility of suing the previous owners for not disclosing information about rot and mold. He said we would have to prove that they knew about it before the sale. This could prove difficult. Upon further investigation, he discovered that the sellers had gone through an expensive divorce and that it was unlikely they would have had the means to pay that amount of money. He said that even if we could get a judgment against them, which was far from certain, getting the money would be a completely different matter. It was a beat blood situation, as he put it. So, looking at it from all sides, I was a loser. A few days after I received bad news about my house, while I was surfing the internet on my iPhone, a pop-up window appeared. It said, The former believer rejected God. 
The punishment will be three curses. The first curse has already begun. Two more to follow unless immediate repentance occurs. Really? A curse? I concluded that the curse statement could have been sent by one of three people. It could have been Tim, Jeremy, or Elder Simpson. Regardless of who was responsible, it was a despicable act. This was definitely not a Christian act. How did they get it to pop up on my iPhone screen? This in itself was a mystery. After two days, I began to believe in curses. Somehow the city found out about the condition of my house. An inspector came, and my house was declared uninhabitable. This meant that I had to leave the house immediately. I then had 30 days to begin repairs or demolish it and remove it from the site. The only other option was to sell it to someone else with full disclosure of the rot and mold. What are the chances that this will lead to a sale? I also learned that insurance companies like to collect their premiums but don't like to pay out money. They would cover roof replacement, but rot and mold were not covered under my policy. My damage was enormous. I knew paying $20,000 to renovate the house was not an option. Demolition and cleanup would have cost me $8,000. Considering that I could have gotten $12,000 for the lot, my loss would still be $76,000. I discussed this with Stefan, and he reluctantly invited me to move in with him. This brought some complications when it was his turn to host the children. It also allowed me to see some sides of him that I hadn't seen before. We were lovers, and as such we were together a lot. But we each had our own little sanctuaries where we could retreat, which meant that we each had our own private lives. We had the best of both worlds. When I moved in with him, we were always together, except when one or both of us were at work. This was a completely different matter. Things that didn't bother me before when I saw them occasionally bothered me much more when I saw them all the time. It was a bunch of little things. His facial expression when I said something he didn't agree with. How quickly he got angry when something went wrong. How he was full of opinions about people, especially my friends. Of course, there was also the universal problem of the raised toilet. Nothing big, just a lot of small but annoying actions and looks. I was particularly disappointed in the way he treated his children. He was very intolerant and quick to punish. It wasn't my place to interfere, so I didn't say anything. His parenting skills were far from what I had seen in Tim. After a month had passed, one day on my way to work, I saw Tim's truck parked outside a hole-in-the-wall cafe where he liked to have breakfast. I decided it was time to confront him about this whole curse thing. When I entered the cafe, he was sitting at the counter. I sat down next to him and said, Let's go to the booth. He looked at me with a surprised expression on his face. He signaled to the waitress, took his coffee, and walked to an open booth. I sat down opposite him and ordered coffee and Danish pie. When the waitress left, I looked him in the eyes and said, Okay, Tim, what is this curse nonsense? His look convinced me that he had no idea what I was talking about. I lived with him for enough years to be able to read him. What are you talking about, Holly? This is strange even for you. What do you mean by the curse nonsense? Looks like you need to shed some light on this. I said, before we get to that, look at this. Showing him the city's sentencing report. He looked stunned. I've heard from kids that you had problems with your house, but I've never heard of it being declared uninhabitable. Can't you get your money back from the seller? He asked. I tried. I consulted with a lawyer. He said I could get a judgment against them, but that was unlikely as we would have to prove they knew about the problem when they sold. Even if we got a decision, the chances of getting the money were very low. They divorced, went bankrupt, and left the area. The lawyer said that after the divorce, they had big financial problems. I can understand that. Been there, been through it, Tim said. I ignored his comment and showed him the message about the curse, saying, if you're not behind this message, then I think it must be Jeremy or Elder Simpson. Holly, how would it help me to do anything to hurt you? I need everything to go well for you and your lover so that he will marry you, and I could start saving some of my salary. I swear to you, I don't know anything about this message. As for Elder Simpson, he died two months ago. How did you not see this in the newspaper? His car was hit by a train. It was all over the news. 
It must have been when Stefan and I were a broad. I didn't follow the news from my hometown. The children told me about your trip. It must have been nice. It's a pity I can't afford such a trip. I ignored this comment. Looks like I need to talk to Jeremy. He must be behind this, I muttered. Holly, he doesn't approve of what you did to me and our family, but he would never do something like that. The boy still loves you. He just can't handle the consequences of what you caused. So where did this message come from, Tim? Do you expect me to believe that it was sent by an angel? No, I think you should pay attention to your lover's wife and his relatives. They are the ones who suffered the most from your actions. I was knocked down, but they were knocked out. His wife seemed to take it quite calmly, Tim. She doesn't seem like a vindictive person, I replied. If she accepted the loss of her husband and family without thoughts of revenge, then she is a saint, Tim replied. Listen, Holly, I know the fire chief well. We play cards once a week. I think I could make an arrangement for you with him. You could offer them your house for a training exercise. They could burn it down and clean up the area. At no cost to you. You could then put the property up for sale. I'm not saying you'd get all your money back, but you could minimize your losses. You'd also get a tax benefit since it would be considered a donation to a charity. If you want, I can ask him to call you. I thought quickly in my head. Losing $68,000 would be better than losing $76,000. Plus, with the tax break, I could end up losing less than $68,000. I thanked Tim and asked him to arrange it with the fire department. I left the restaurant thinking about Tim. He had every reason to hate me, but I'm sure he had nothing to do with the curse report, and I think his idea of donating the house to the fire department might be my best option. I doubt anyone would buy a house that has been declared uninhabitable. I could be trapped, having to pay for its demolition and cleanup. Donating it to the fire department would save me from that. Two days later, I received a call from the fire chief. He wanted to inspect my house to see if it was suitable for a training exercise. He asked about the mold, and I told him the whole story. I met with him at the house, and he inspected the damaged area then said he wanted a structural engineer to inspect the damaged area to see if it would be safe for his people to conduct a training exercise. The engineer arrived about an hour later and completed his inspection. He told me he would give his report to the fire chief. The next day, Tim called me. He said he had good news for me. The structural engineer's report showed that the mold in the house was not toxic. He tested it in two different laboratories and both confirmed that the mold was not toxic. The original report was incorrect. Dry rot can be repaired, but non-toxic mold can be easily removed. A local company can make a home safe and habitable for about $5,000. The work can be completed in a week. Needless to say, I was delighted. I'm so glad I decided to stop and talk to Tim that day. And how grateful I was for his interest in my problem. Stefan was no help at all. Thanks to Tim, we discovered that there was no toxic mold and that rotten wood could be replaced for little money. Who was behind all this false information that led to my home being declared uninhabitable? Could I hold someone accountable? Two weeks later, I returned to my own little house. I was very happy to be in charge of my life again. The truth is that I didn't really enjoy living with Stefan. I believe he too was relieved to see me leave. It also meant a significant reduction in the time I spent with Stefan. Our dates have been reduced to a minimum. When I threatened to sue the company that filed the false mold report, they settled the case and paid for the repairs. In the end, it didn't cost me anything, and I had a new roof and a healthy home. At that moment, I stopped and thought. It did not escape my notice that when trouble struck, Stefan did next to nothing to help me. It was Tim who came to my aid. After everything I did to him, he was by my side. He could rejoice at my karmic retribution and leave me in the lurch, but he is not that kind of person. When we started having problems, if he had satisfied some of my whims and allowed me to wander a little, maybe buy motorcycles for both of us, I would be happy. I think contentment is a key word for us in many ways. I was happy with my life until the day I stopped being that way. I was content with my husband, my family, my home, and even my church. My sex life was by no means the same as what I had with Stefan, but I was happy with it. In fact, 
The feeling of satisfaction I felt while cuddling after sex with Tim was just as powerful in its own way as the excitement I felt with Stefan. Having said that, I know I could never be sexually satisfied with Tim anymore, not after I experienced Stefan in bed. There is one case of escalation. It's hard to go back. Escalation feeds on itself. Once I experienced the new sex positions and the almost painfully erotic sensations that Stefan provided, I looked forward rather than back. How long will this go on before I need something new to satisfy? Escalation requires more escalation, not less. I started to wonder if I could change this. Can I go against the grain and start downshifting? My thoughts were interrupted by another pop-up message. This time it simply said, The second curse is coming. Be ready. Nothing bad happened until the following Thursday when I received a frantic call from Anna saying that Maxwell, my grandson, had been in an accident on his ATV. He was in the hospital. He suffered serious head and back injuries. Doctors warned that there was a chance he would be paralyzed. Stefan was on a business trip to a car show. Without hesitation, I picked up the phone and called Tim. He was also informed and was about to leave work to pack his things and go to Anna. Tim, do you want to come with me? I asked. I can come and pick you up. I've already packed my bags. I can be at the house in a few minutes. Just look for my Mustang. Holly, let's take my SUV. This Mustang has too many bad memories for me. Plus, an SUV has a lot more room for luggage and stuff. Okay, Tim, I understand that. You know where I am. I'll be ready when you get there. I called Stefan and left a message telling him what happened. I told him that I was going to Anna to be with her family and help. However, I didn't tell him that I was going with Tim. When Tim arrived, I put my things in his SUV. During this, I told him that I had received a second message about a curse, which may have caused Maxwell's accident. Holly, are you saying you received another one of those messages and it predicted what happened to Maxwell? He exclaimed. Show it to me, Holly. What does it say? I showed him the message and handed him my phone number. He took my phone and handed me the keys to his SUV. Do you want me to drive? I asked. Lead while I read, he replied. It didn't occur to me that he asked me to drive his precious SUV. After he read the message, he said, It's not very specific. It might just be a weird coincidence. Maybe, I replied, but you admit that would be a damn strange coincidence. Yes, I see it, but I can't bring myself to believe that these are messages from God. These are strange things, Holly, very strange. When we arrived, we went straight to the hospital. The news was disappointing. Maxwell couldn't move his legs. He was paralyzed from the waist down. If the paralysis persists, they might try surgery. They called a specialist from another city for consultation. When the specialist arrived and examined Maxell, he said there was a 50-50 chance that Maxell would recover within the next one to two weeks. If the paralysis persists, the surgery's chances of success are slightly less than 50-50. He will have to wait until the swelling subsides and severe inflammation subsides before he can proceed with the operation. He advised us to schedule surgery now so that we would be on the list if it was needed. In any case, we can always cancel if the paralysis goes away. The family was unanimous that we should give Maxell every chance to recover, so we scheduled surgery. We all agreed to share any costs not covered by insurance. The day Tim and I left for home, there was still no improvement. It looks like Maxell will actually need surgery. Tim and I didn't get to talk one-on-one -on -one until we were in the Jeep heading home. We decided that we would go halfway and stop for lunch. He told me to choose a which part of the journey I wanted to lead. I said I wanted to lead first, in case he changed his mind. He assured me that he would not change his mind. He handed me the keys again. Tim, I feel like I'm to blame for what happened to Maxwell. As much as I'd like to think this is all some twilight thing with these curses, I can't help but think they're meant to punish me. Holly, think about it. If this is to punish you, why am I suffering too? I'm just as hurt for Maxell as you are. So if this is punishment, it's aimed at both of us. I was the one who almost lost my house because of that first curse, Tim. You're just collateral damage from that second curse. Tim, I spent many years around you and never heard fire and brimstone sermons from you. 
but I heard a lot of them from other preachers. I remember Elder Simpson himself quoting these words, My vengeance and retribution, in due time, their foot will slip. For the day of their disaster is near, and the things that are coming to them are hastening towards them. Tim, I think the upcoming things are rushing towards me. Holly, this is a quote from the Old Testament. I think God treated us differently in the Old Testament than Jesus did in the New. It's a little like raising children. When a child is young and just learning, there are things he can't do. Understand no matter how much you try to explain. Sometimes you need to teach them through corporal punishment. When they are older, you can negotiate with them. Corporal punishment is no longer necessary. Jesus taught us and understood us through love. He moved away from corporal punishment. Do you remember how an easily accessible girl was brought to him, and he asked the one without sin to throw a stone at her? He also forgave her. I remember that story, Tim. You know what I always think about when I hear it? I always wonder why Jesus didn't ask where the man was. It takes two to tango, Tim. As usual, only the woman was dragged out to be executed. You're right, Holly. I haven't thought about it. In your case, I don't think for a moment that the so-called cursed messages are from God or that you are responsible for what happened to Maxell. What you did basically hurt me. I have forgiven you. If I have forgiven you, how can God not forgive you too? You need to stop blaming yourself. I hope you can forgive me too. I can't believe this man. I hurt him as much as I could and he talks about forgiveness. What kind of person is he? Why did I turn away from him? When Tim dropped me off at the house, I kissed him lightly on the cheek and thanked him for everything. My son still doesn't talk to me. My daughters put up with me. They were nice to me when Tim and I went to Maxwell's. They were nice to me, but they treated Tim with love. The difference was palpable, and I felt it. Everyone saw it. Tim went above and beyond to include me in everything. I believe Tim has truly forgiven me. His actions prove this. Ever since Tim said it was probably Stefan's ex who was sending the messages, I've been thinking about Celia. Was she behind it? Did she have the computer skills for something like that? Or was it Stefan himself? Were the two of them involved in this? I just do not know. My mind went numb. All I know for sure is that I made a terrible mistake. I wanted an exciting life, and I more than got it. I ruined the life of a good man who had proven himself reliable over the years for the excitement of a young man who offered everything I thought I was looking for. Stefan was very good in bed. Sex with him was never boring. Yes, we went on exciting trips and attended exclusive events together. Never mind that we financed most of it with my alimony payments from my average ex-husband. It doesn't matter that Stefan never proposed to me or bought me a ring. He had no intention of killing the goose that laid the golden eggs that made it all possible. However, things began to cool between us. I began to suspect that he had found someone else. What did I expect? He cheated on his wife with me. I wasn't even married to him. What could keep him from leaving our relationship? What could keep him from cheating on me? I knew the answer to this question. Absolutely nothing. The weeks passed. I rarely saw Stefan. I haven't seen Tim since we returned from visiting Maxell. Talk about an ordinary life. I admit that I was excited. I had a collection of dildos, but they didn't do much for me. So I was pleasantly surprised to see Stefan coming up my driveway just after I got home from work. I offered to cook us dinner. He said, Don't worry about dinner. You will have plenty to eat. I have a pleasant surprise for you. He picked me up and headed into the bedroom. I won't lie. I was prepared for what he had in mind. We were on my bed. He warmed me up with his caresses. He didn't intend to do anything more than foreplay. I was like a firework. It wasn't like Stefan. He had never delayed things like this before. I was on the edge. I was about to grab one of my dildos when the doorbell rang. Stefan jumped up and ran to the door naked. I heard him talking to someone in the living room. Why did he let someone into the house? That question was answered when the bedroom door opened and he walked in with two other naked men. I looked up and said, What the hell, Stefan? Well, Holly, my little girl, I remembered your fantasy about something new in sex. Now your fantasy becomes reality. Together, the three of us will give you an unforgettable experience. I consulted with an attorney about the possibility of suing the previous owners for not disclosing information about rot and mold. 
He said we would have to prove that they knew about it before the sale. This could prove difficult. Upon further investigation, he discovered that the sellers had gone through an expensive divorce and that it was unlikely they would have had the means to pay that amount of money. He said that even if we could get a judgment against them, which was far from certain, getting the money would be a completely different matter. It was a beat blood situation, as he put it. So, looking at it from all sides, I was a loser. A few days after I received bad news about my house, while I was surfing the internet on my iPhone, a pop-up window appeared. It said, The former believer rejected God. The punishment will be three curses. The first curse has already begun. Two more to follow unless immediate repentance occurs. Really? A curse? I concluded that the curse statement could have been sent by one of three people. It could have been Tim, Jeremy, or Elder Simpson. Regardless of who was responsible, it was a despicable act. This was definitely not a Christian act. How did they get it to pop up on my iPhone screen? This in itself was a mystery. After two days, I began to believe in curses. Somehow the city found out about the condition of my house. An inspector came, and my house was declared uninhabitable. This meant that I had to leave the house immediately. I then had 30 days to begin repairs or demolish it and remove it from the site. The only other option was to sell it to someone else with full disclosure of the rotten mold. What are the chances that this will lead to a sale? I also learned that insurance companies like to collect their premiums but don't like to pay out money. They would cover roof replacement, but rot and mold were not covered under my policy. My damage was enormous. I knew paying $20,000 to renovate the house was not an option. Demolition and cleanup would have cost me $8,000. Considering that I could have gotten $12,000 for the lot, my loss would still be $76,000. I discussed this with Stefan, and he reluctantly invited me to move in with him. This brought some complications when it was his turn to host the children. It also allowed me to see some sides of him that I hadn't seen before. We were lovers, and as such, we were together a lot. As the sexual activities continued, he saw how thin I was. He saw how my desire turned into helplessness. It didn't make him feel better. It made him feel worse. He felt dirty, defiled, and tainted. For some reason, his hatred of what Jamie had done to him turned into sympathy for this woman who went from desire and passion to hopelessness and regret. He saw me as Jamie before her fatal affair. He wanted to do for me what he couldn't do for her. He was sent by God to this devil-possessed woman I had become. We shared our lives through endless conversation that day. It continued through the simple but delicious lunch he prepared for us and dinner at a nice restaurant that evening. When he drove me home, I felt like I was with an old friend. He said he felt the same way. When we arrived at my entrance, he jumped out and opened the door for me. He left his car running as he walked me to my door. I was confused. I asked him to park his car in the garage and stay with me for the night. He said he couldn't switch that quickly. He said, I participated in your desecration last night, and now I will be your lover tonight. I want to be your lover, but I want it to happen when you calm down and understand everything that happened. You need to understand how you feel about Stefan and Tim before you consider forgiving me, let alone loving me. I watched him drive away and it was like saying goodbye to my best friend. Basically, he saved me. Yes, he participated in that sex, but so did I. I may have become a victim as events progressed, but in the beginning I was a willing participant. One thing is clear. I lived through my fantasy, and there was nothing left of it in my heart and brain. No more fantasies for me. I want reality, whatever it turns out to be. Then came another vital day. That was the day Anna called to tell me that Maxwell was improving. That night he moved his ankles and toes. He could also feel touches on his legs. Doctors gave him a very good chance of a full recovery. Full recovery? It couldn't be better. I was as happy as I could be in months. Maxell is doing great, and I'm back in my little house. God is in heaven and all is well on earth. The only thing that bothered me was that Anna said that she tried to call her father several times to tell him the good news, 
but both his home and cell phones went to voicemail. She left messages, but there was no response from him. It was strange. I decided to drive past the old house on my way to work. His truck was not parked in the yard, but what struck me was the for sale sign on the lawn. I called Dolly. She couldn't contact her father either, but she was just as surprised as I was to see the for sale sign. She speculated that some children might have put it there as a joke, or that the real estate agency had placed it there by mistake. I saved the real estate agency's phone number in my phone contacts. While I was doing this, I received another pop-up message. It said, Today comes the third and final curse. Now my day was not so happy. When I arrived at work, I called the real estate agency. They confirmed that Tim Sherman had authorized his son, Jeremy, to list the house for sale. The listing was completed two days ago. With this information, I decided to do the only thing I could, gather my strength and call Jeremy. He might tell me to go to hell, but I had to try. I called his cell phone and he surprised me by answering. What do you want? He growled. Jeremy, I know you hate me and you have good reasons, but for the love of God, son, please tell me why your father is selling the house and why he won't answer the phone. Why do you need this, mom? Why the hell do you think this concerns you? You left him for some slug, forgot about it? Okay, Jeremy, if the mistake I made can never be forgiven, if you can't understand that I never stopped loving you or your father, then perhaps it's just like your father always said, if I needed to know, I would have been told. You remember him saying that, don't you, son? Okay, mom, since you think you're responsible for what's happening, I think you should know what you did. That man you left after all these years together. That man you still claim to love. That man, he's dying, Mom. He's dying. He is in a cancer hospital in Houston. I'm the only family member here at his bedside. When you thought he had ED and left for someone more masculine. When you found a lover to replace your non-working husband. Did it ever occur to you that it could be something more than just erectile dysfunction? Did the word cancer come to mind? In your absence, I brought him here to Houston to have his prostate removed. When they did preliminary staging tests, they found that his cancer had spread. It was stage four. When I asked the doctor about the extent of the spread, he said that the list of places he didn't get to would be shorter than the list of places he did get to. Maybe that's why you can't get through to him. Better go back to that male who makes you happy in bed. Daddy can't do that anymore. You were right about that, Mom. It's good that you found that guy. At that moment, Jeremy's shell cracked, and he began to sob. Son, listen to me. I'm on my way to Houston right now. How do I get to the hospital? What's his room number? When Jeremy was able to speak again, he announced that they were returning home. They will leave in a few hours. Tim will be moving into skilled nursing at a home right next door to our old home. He will remain there until he dies. Hospice will be there to help him in his final days. As for your question about selling the house, Mom, he had to spend a lot of money to buy out your share of the house. The alimony you received was also a burden. Since you also received half of all his assets, and since he can no longer work, he's selling the house so he doesn't leave us kids with huge medical bills when he leaves. I hope this makes you happy, Mom. You win, he lost. He lost big. He's about as low as he can go. It's all thanks to you, Mom. Keep enjoying your newfound happiness and leave us alone. Jeremy, listen to me and believe every word I say. I want you to call the real estate agency and cancel the listing. I want you to bring Tim home to his house. I will take time off from work. I will take care of him. 24 hours a day in his home. He will be in a home that he loves and will be looked after by a person who loves him. I really love him, Jeremy, I do. I haven't won anything. I've lost more than you can imagine. I will dedicate myself to caring for the man who took such good care of me for so many years. I promise that, son. At home, in his house, you and your sisters can come and stay any time. Your old rooms will be ready. I will take care of it. I suppose everything, as you said, is my fault. I know it. It is my duty to do it for him and our children. I will make sure he has everything he needs. I will use that money you mentioned to do everything I can to make him feel comfortable. Jeremy, can you do this for him? I'm begging you, son. Please help me help him. It makes sense, son. You know it does. When Jeremy calmed down, 
He replied, Thank you, Mom. I was praying for something like this to happen. I was praying for a miracle. I never imagined, after everything that happened, that you would be the miracle. I'll make calls to the agency. Real estate and long-term care facilities. I'll cancel both. I'll bring Dad home. Thanks, Mom. I was sitting on the porch swing when Tim and Jeremy pulled up to the house. I ran out to the car and opened the passenger door. I helped Tim out of the car and walked with him hand in hand to the porch steps. It was difficult for him to climb the stairs with my help. I was shocked at how weak he had become since I last saw him. He was out of breath when he finally sat down in his favorite chair. Jeremy showed me the bag of medications the hospital sent home with him. There were three sheets of instructions on how and when to take the medications. The first step was to make Tim comfortable. Then I prepared snacks for him and Jeremy. After Jeremy left, Tim and I stayed together in this special house for the first time in many moons. We talked like two old friends who had not seen each other for many years. We had a lot to catch up on. Finally, Tim got tired and took a nap. While he was sleeping, I read all the instructions provided by the doctors. I was determined to give him the best possible care. When it was time for bed, I helped Tim into bed. He suffered from severe back pain. I rubbed the provided ointment onto the sore spot. Finally, he was able to relieve the pain and fall asleep. I climbed into bed with him. I wanted to be there if he needed anything. One night, I sensed that he was in trouble. He seemed panicked. I reached out and touched him. He looked at me, there next to him. He grabbed my hand. He calmed down immediately. He held my hand until he fell asleep again. As the days passed, we became as close as before. We spent many happy hours reminiscing. We talked a lot about the past, but never about the future. We felt comfortable with each other like never before. We were as happy as we could be, given the circumstances. We hugged every night. There were also many hours when we just held each other and cried. Maybe we cried for different reasons, but our tears merged into a river of pain, regret, and hopelessness. As his condition continued to deteriorate, we were forced to purchase a walker. A few weeks later, we bought a wheelchair. I knew time was running out, and I desperately wanted to take Tim to church one more time, but we needed a specially equipped van to do it. I visited a dealer who I knew sold specialty vehicles. They found a van that was exactly what we needed. It was one of those tall Mercedes vans called a Sprinter that had been modified, including a lift and other equipment to accommodate a wheelchair. The seller was not sure if they could accept the motorcycle as payment. He went to talk to his boss about the matter. When he returned, he said that the boss was already on his way down to us, but halfway there he turned around and returned to his office. The salesman assumed that his boss must have received an important call. We waited a few minutes for the boss. The salesman treated us to coffee and donuts while we waited. Talk about surprises. When the boss joined us, it was Luke. He said, when I saw who the client was, I took some time to think about the situation. I made a few calls and I have an offer for you. I joked, oh, Luke, it's so unexpected, but I accept it. He smiled and said, that will come later, but I like your answer. He told me that one of his rules was to never turn down a sale. But in my case, since he knew the circumstances, he made a few calls and found a perfectly equipped van that he could lend me. He pointed out that when the inevitable happened, I'd be stuck with a van I didn't need, plus I'd lose the Harley and Mustang I loved. He said that if I agreed, it wouldn't cost me anything no matter how long it took me to get the van. He could deliver it on Friday. I was delighted. I said, Luke, you have no idea how glad I am to have met you. I know the circumstances were terrible, but at least some good came out of a bad thing. This will be so good for Tim. I will be forever grateful. How did we talk for so long and I didn't know anything about how you make a living? Well, Holly, I don't know anything about your work either. I think we had more important things to discuss. Don't you think we need to talk more? When the time comes, let's do it. I hugged him and whispered my answer in his ear. He smiled. When I got home, I told Tim that I had rented a wheelchair-accessible van. I told him we would use it to get to church on Sunday. I was surprised when he told me that he had not been to church since the day I left him. Tears rolled down my cheeks as I screamed, What have I done? I have turned you away from your God. No, Holly, don't blame yourself. 
when you started the path that eventually took you away from me? When did you buy a Harley and a Mustang? When you began to challenge my authority as the head of the family and even the word of God on which it was based, I began to pray. I prayed harder than ever before. I prayed for guidance to keep you close to me and for the preservation of our family. The day you left, I said my last prayer. More precisely, I shouted a prayer at the top of my lungs. This was the prayer that Jesus offered from the cross. Father, why have you forsaken me? This was the last prayer that passed through my lips. I haven't gone to church or prayed since then. While we are already talking about this, when you told me about the curses, I knew it was my rejection that caused everything. You blame yourself, but in reality you suffered collateral damage because I rejected God. Oh, Tim, I don't believe that. Your God would never turn his back on you like that. You've served him well for as long as I've known you. He's a God of love. Holly, look at me. Does this shell of a man look like a man loved by God? Do you think I feel his love? I've never felt so alone. I've lost both you and God. You may have lost me for a while, but I'm sure you haven't lost God, I said. Then, out of the blue, he asked me if I was a feminist. I really didn't want to venture into uncharted waters that could be counterproductive, but I knew I couldn't ignore him. I told him that I was more of an egalitarian than a feminist. I don't know if there is such a thing, but that's what I believe in. I am for marriage equality. That evening I prayed for the first time in a long time. I admitted to God that I don't know how he awards points for entering heaven. I stated that if I had accumulated any points for being a devoted wife for over twenty years and raising three fine children, I would like to have those points transferred to Tim's account. I admitted that it was my fault that he lost faith. On Sunday we actually went to church. Everyone was so happy to see us. We were received with open arms. It seemed like we never left. We met Elder Young. He was Elder Simpson's successor. He had an appropriate name as he looked very young. It was very different in many aspects from its predecessor. It was good to be back in our church home. I repeated the prayer I said on Friday as I stood at the altar of the church where Tim and I got married. I have never prayed harder in my life. When we were leaving, I saw Luke. He was talking to Elder Young. Tim was busy talking to his friends, so I excused myself and went to Luke. Elder Young saw me and said, Holly, this is my big brother, Luther. I extended my hand as if we had never met, but Luke held my hand in both of his as he said, Brother, this is the woman I told you about. Elder Young said, I completely understand. I pray to God that he surrounds you both with his forgiveness, love, and blessings. He's not done with you two yet. Luke squeezed my hand, saying, I sure hope so. When someone else started talking to Elder Young, I turned to Luke. It seems like there's a lot I don't know about you. Did you tell him how we met? Every detail, Holly. He reminded me that God works in mysterious ways. Can you imagine a weirder or more mysterious way to meet the person you'll marry? He asked. No, I cannot. Did I understand correctly? Did I just receive my second marriage proposal of the day? When the moment is right, I will do it right. In the meantime, just make room in your heart for me. Already done, Luke. Already done. With these words, I returned to Tim with a tear on my cheek. Deep down, I knew that I was going from one good man to another. Deep down, I knew I didn't deserve any of them. I am so grateful for the last two months that Tim and I were able to spend together in our family home. I am glad that the children could come often. We were all together for Independence Day. The view of the fireworks from our veranda was magnificent. It was so good to be a family again. I knew the end was near. In my thoughts, I imagined the whole family gathering at Tim's bedside in our beautiful home as he passed peacefully into the arms of his God. It wasn't like that when it happened. That night Tim was in worse pain than ever. I gave him the maximum allowable dose of painkiller, but it didn't help. Suddenly he couldn't breathe. He had to make every effort to take a breath. 
He was struggling so hard that his chest was rising off the bed with every breath he took as he tried to get oxygen. It was just the two of us there. The family was unaware of this sudden development. I couldn't see him suffering like that. I went out onto the porch and called our family doctor. When he heard what was happening, he sent an ambulance to take us to the hospital. He told me they would make Tim's last hours comfortable. I called Jeremy and told him where we were. He called the others. When I was allowed into Tim's room, he was already being given medication through an intravenous drip. He was still having difficulty breathing, but the medication seemed to calm him down. I allowed myself to wonder if they had found a miracle cure to make him better. I read the name on the IV. It was morphine. Not a miracle cure, but a source of much-needed relief. A few minutes later, he was sleeping peacefully. A few hours later, the whole family gathered at his bedside. Elder Young was there, too. We were all there with him, wondering if every breath he took would be his last. It was almost as I had imagined, but not at home. Somehow, he made it through the night. It looked like he didn't want to leave us. One of the nurses told us to talk to him and let him know it was okay to let go. I refused to do this. This was not okay. I wanted him to be with me as long as possible. As the day the first rays of the sun were shining through the window, I held his hand in mine and swore that I would never let go, and I didn't let go. I held it until the end of his life, which came about 15 minutes later. The alarm went off. We all looked at the heart monitor. It showed a straight line. I stayed with Tim until they came for his body. As they carried him away, I swear I saw something leave his body and fly out the window. I ran to the window and watched it fly away. It made a loop towards our old house and then went straight up. I watched it rise and waved goodbye to it, saying, Fly away, my love. Fly to a better place where you will be truly appreciated. Fly away. Through my tears, I saw Luke enter the room. He came up to me and hugged me. He wiped away my tears and stayed by my side as I continued to stand at the window. If I had good binoculars or a small telescope, I could see the house in which our little family was so happy. But I knew that it would never again be a place of happiness for us. It was not the house that provided our happiness. This was a family who lived and loved within its walls. It was laughter that echoed in the corridors. These were the memories everyone remembered. It was joy that radiated from every window. It was a world that permeated every corner. Above all, it was the man who made it all possible. Now it's just a house. I was pulled out of my thoughts when my iPhone made a sound. I knew that sound. It signaled a new pop-up window. This was the last thing I wanted to see. Please, no new curses. My hand was shaking as I took out my phone. I looked at the message. It was just three words. It simply said, it's all over. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.